actually, I'm going to move it back to the title slide because I just had that nice frame of the campus up there. Um, I'm going to keep this relatively short and relatively informal. The topic is energy, sustainability, and cost. I should say by way of background that um, in the last year, I have chaired a committee at Colgate that has been charged with re reducing the budgetary demands on the college's expenses so that we can get spending and cost and uh, revenue back in line. We were called the Economic Environment Working Group. And uh, we've been successful. We've done some, I think, very good things uh, in terms of realigning some of our resources without changing programs at all. And, um, but one of the areas, of course, that's of concern is energy and energy costs. And as we all know, we're living in a world where because of all kinds of circumstances, the energy resources particularly that are available to us here in the U.S. are very significant and important. And for Colgate, Colgate is this very tiny place that sits in the middle of upstate New York in a very rural area. But we're not immune from all the comings and goings of issues that are related to energy. We are also a place that cares about efficiency and sustainability and the ability to reduce our uh, demand on fossil fuel resource, resources, for example. So um, all of that come, has come together in an interesting way for me, uh, caring as I do about Colgate and the long-term viability of the place and also having an interest in energy because as a geologist, uh, a lot of uh, our geologists that have graduated from Colgate have gone into the oil and gas industry and other areas in energy. And uh, today we continue to face many of the same issues with energy supply and demand that will employ geologists in the future, which is a good thing um, from my perspective. Uh, also, by way of background, I, I actually went to graduate school planning to go to work for a major oil company. Uh, the fellow that, who was a Denison College graduate, uh, George Ramsayer, that I went through graduate school with, went to work for ExxonMobil about the same time that I would have gone to work. I ended up back teaching at Colgate. It's now uh, 36 years later. He's retired. But I'm still doing what I love to do, so it's, it's been great. And I'm happy. He lives in Middlebury, Vermont now, not Houston. So uh, I, 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 he's, George is happy too. But so th th there's a little bit of background. And I just, I, I love this photo in part because it demonstrates one of the wonderfully, uh, one of the major resources that we have in the area from an energy perspective, and that's biomass. Upstate New York, uh, and just a bit of background, in 1933, the first year that we have aerial photographs of the town of Hamilton, 69% of the land area was under cultivation, and only about 20% of the, the rest was various town, village and town area, and uh, only uh, slightly more than 20% was forested. Today, about 70% of the same area is forested. The great northern forests have come back. And so, as I'll explain, one of our major energy resources now for the campus is, as you probably know, wood chips. Biomass is the fancy word. But look at all that forest, the campus there, looking uh, lovely as it always does, um, particularly that time of year, which is early summer when everything is bright green and, 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 and glorious. But here, here's where we are today. And that looks just a tiny bit out of focus. So. Um, we live, uh, in, a, in a way, in a bit of an energy nirvana in, in, in Hamilton because of some unique circumstances that are really not so much of our doing. Um, we have a Hamilton municipal utility. The village of Hamilton runs its own municipal utility. They distribute electricity over part of the township of Hamilton, and that includes Colgate, and we're obviously the biggest... Uh, customer, and so we have done a lot of in infrastructure things with them. That Municipal Utility Corporation can buy power from the New York State Power Authority, which is interestingly enough headed by a Colgate graduate class of 71, Richie Kessel, who lived next to me my sophomore year for part of the time that I lived in Shepherdson House. He was on the other side of the bathroom. Uh, Rich Kessel is now heading up the New York State Power Authority. 
And we buy, that is the Hamilton Municipal Utility buys its power through contracts that are very, give us very low rates on the order of three cents a kilowatt hour. And so if you know anything about electricity, these are incredibly low rates. And it's most, mostly non-fossil fuel. It's hydro, mainly nuclear, and some wind because we have uh, continuing development of wind resources uh, regionally that have added to that mix. We like to say we live in an island of low costs surrounded by rising tide of higher costs. And we know that uh, 20, there's a renegotiation in a couple of years that's only a piece of the contract, but by 2022, we're going to be having, we will have much higher electric rates. I mentioned wood chips. We currently get about 80% or 85% of our steam for the main campus from burning wood chips. That was installed in 1986, and that was uh, a very far-sighted move on the part of uh, campus leadership at the time. Uh, we look to expand that uh, probably in the future because whether it's wood chips or other biomass, renewable biomass sources like switchgrass or uh, cultivated willow, we see that given our re rural regional uh, rural location and the regional uh, energy markets as a place to go. We do burn number six fuel oil uh, for the, some of the uh, backup heat. That, that is a system that we'd like to change because number six is a very carbon intensive fuel. And uh, our vehicle fleet is gasoline and we also use uh, number two fuel oil, which is lighter for a lot of the Broad Street houses, the uh, Sanford Field House, uh, the townhouses where, where Kristen and, and Christian uh, live are, are um, heated by uh, number two. And we'd like to investigate alternatives there as well. We are, uh, Colgate is a member of something called the President's Climate Commitment. That is a group of college presidents that have committed to lowering carbon footprints over the coming decades. Uh, Colgate is quite remarkable in that we are among the lowest. If you look at our peer institutions, uh, there's Bucknell, for those of you who know about Bucknell. Uh, Colgate, this is per FTE, the average of this group of peer institutions is 10.3, we're at 6.2. Bates is clearly cooking the books, so I won't say anything <laughs> about that. But that this is due to the fact that our biomass sources are, carbon, are counted as carbon neutral in this assessment. So if you burn wood chips rather than burning coal, uh, you get a tremendous CO2 benefit that way. Some of our, uh, but one of the problems is that our, our current uh, CO2 load is in some sense almost irreducible because a lot of it is related to travel. And we were talking in the group about study groups earlier on. Every time a Colgate student gets, to, gets on a plane and flies to St. Andrews, uh, to Glasgow to uh, go on a study group, that counts against our carbon uh, total. So there may be some things that we can do in terms of the, our local campus properties to actually offset that by sequestering carbon by growing, for example, new uh, forests, new trees. And I just, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but biomass, we are wonderfully lucky to be located where we are. And as we look ahead, increasing the amount of our, our heat and, and, and uh, actually cooling that we get from biomass steam is uh, something that we would like to do. There's some possibilities such as in biomass now is burned directly and basically what are big wood furnaces that fire, uh, that heat steam boilers. There's an alternative methodology of turning that into something called syngas. You basically cook the wood and you take off a, a burnable a gas product, and that you can do away from the main campus. So we might locate a syngas facility some distance from the main campus and then actually keep the boilers where they currently are. There are some advantages. We are in a depressed economic area with agriculture really in serious decline because of uh, national and international competition for things like milk. Uh, and to give farmers a way of using their land to grow a cash crop would be a wonderful, wonderful thing for the region. So these are early developments. Colgate has its own uh, very small uh, seven and a half acre plot of willow, which we will grow and crop. 
we have some outlying properties which we might develop further. Um, we've looked a little bit at wind. Uh, 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 there are significant developments in wind power in upstate New York. One of the first in New York is, is actually visible from the Colgate campus in Madison, New York. Where there were seven towers. There's a large development up on uh, the Tug Hill Plateau of almost 300 wind towers now. Uh, others in Madison County uh, within uh, just a few miles of Hamilton. And those are developments which are adding uh, renewable power to the grid. We've also had students and um, actually some of our campus engineers look into shallow geothermal. Shallow geothermal is a way of taking heat from the ground and using heat pump systems. The, it, once you get below about eight feet uh, depth in upstate New York, believe it or not, the groundwater, uh, the ground is, has a constant temperature of about 52 degrees. So if you live in a cave in the winter, you are always at 52 or 3 degrees. If you live in the cave in the summer, you're also at 52 or 3 degrees. But we actually take advantage of that heat storage, use heat pumps to condense the heat basically out of that slightly cooler air in the ground. And that might work for some of our outlying buildings. The problem for Hamilton is that we have um, our electric rates are dependent on us not exceeding electric use and geothermal heat pump systems use a fair bit of electricity. So there's some issues there. Hey, Bruce, by the way, yeah. here it's 54 to 55. Well, that's one, of the, yeah, that's one of the great advantages. And you have the advantage here in, uh, in the coastal areas particularly. You can use heat pumps directly out of the air because your air temperatures are generally, um, there are exceptions, but are generally around freezing or above. We can't pump, we can't use air as a heat pump source in January in Hamilton. It just doesn't work. It turns out it's cold up there some of the time. So these are some things we're looking at. And we have lots of wind towers close by and we're all used to it. Whether the campus community would be in favor of placing one of these up on the hill above the old golf course is another question. I think that would be an interesting discussion. We've, we've had classes in environmental studies examine siting and most students, it's interesting, as, as pro-renewable, sustainable, green energy students are, they'd prefer to see the windmills put some distance from campus. <laughs> it's called not in my backyard. And it's interesting, actually just last week, the New York State Power Authority, and this is Richie Kessel again, uh, agreed that it would not proceed with an attempt to place a very large project along the eastern end of Lake Ontario because of resistance from local communities. And I've actually worked with one of the communities up there a number of years ago. I'm on the planning board for one of our local townships and we developed wind tower regulations about five or six years ago. I went up there and, and did a little small consulting job with the group that was trying to do the same thing in the, along the eastern end of Lake Ontario. and. Uh, the vehemence in that community about this issue was just remarkable. Uh, people were either pro, 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 or they were con, 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 and there was no, there was no middle ground. So that outcome is not surprising. So here's the campus and just some of the locations. Uh, Colgate, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but Colgate owns uh, a chunk of land out about seven, well, six and a half miles west of Hamilton called the Bucus Center which sits up on some very high terrain and has favorable wind conditions. Some of you recent folks would remember the Bucus Center. That was actually given to Colgate by uh, Gary Bucus, who was um, uh, chair of the Board of Trustees through um, well, the very late 80s and, and early 90s. And his father was a professor of economics at Colgate who became president of St. Lawrence University, just to make all the connections. Another location might be Campus South. Colgate also owns some land, by the way, just for location sense, that's the campus. That's the old quarry uh, where the stone for alumni and East and West Hall was quarried. And Colgate owns a fair bit of property here. We also own the old Filer Parker farm uh, and Trillium Mountain sits up high. So those are some locations that students and others have suggested. There's no plan currently to move towards wind power. We're very, uh, the community is very active uh, in some other ways. We've, we've gotten a, a very good new person managing our sustainability office. 
which is attempting to coordinate all these efforts of uh, reducing energy demand, reducing energy for uh, reducing uh, waste, re uh, increasing the use of recycling, uh, using recycling paper, and so forth. And so uh, that's uh, very much an ongoing thing. This dovetails with some local uh, or regional initiatives. Um, our landfill in Madison County is doing uh, methane capture, where they pump methane out of the old landfill waste and burn it in a basically a big uh, internal combustion engine and generate about 1.5 megawatts of electricity, enough to heat a fair, fair sized uh, number of homes. So. Uh, th some of these things are going on locally, and we also take field trips. I, one of my favorite field trips is to take students to uh, the Madison County landfill where we visit the recycling center. We actually, they see where their garbage goes, and separating out of recyclables allows the landfill to reduce its waste stream that goes into the landfill, and this is a saleable product that they get, uh, in that case, it's uh, metal cans on the left and plastic on the right and bales that they sell as a marketable product. Madison County developed a scheme for recycling in the early 1990s. Rather than using big sophisticated equipment, which many areas use, and grind up the recyclables and separate them mechanically, they actually hire about 18 workers in a program that is called the ARC. It used to be the, called the Association for Retarded Citizens, but that got changed a number of years ago. And those folks who would otherwise be not employable are earning minimum wage job, are working at minimum wage jobs, basically handling this material. So the material is hand, separated by hand. It runs on a, it, it, it pays for itself. And a number of those folks have gone on to full-time jobs actually working in the area. So rather than investing in a big multi-million dollar piece of equipment technology, they've actually done something to hire local folks who would not otherwise have jobs. I, it, it warms my heart whenever I'm up there to see this. It's, you know, you're in the midst of all this trash and stuff, but it, it works. So that was a, a class uh, field trip this fall that I took up there. And this is our, you know, uh, that's a new uh, methane extraction. So they're taking methane out of the landfill, burning it in an internal combustion engine, using the waste heat to heat that recycling facility, and putting 1.5 megawatts into the grid. They actually sell that electricity back to our uh, to National Grid, which is our regional utility. And finally, I'll, uh, uh, brings me to the hottest topic in upstate New York right now in terms of the environment and energy is uh, natural gas, particularly what we call the Marcella Shale. And some of you, I, I know a couple of people here I've already talked to. Have you two met, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Just make sure that you know that they're both interested in uh, environment, energy, Marcella Shale gas and all that. Uh, there is... <laughs> There is a strong likelihood that new natural gas pipeline, which is currently does not exist in the village or for Colgate, would come to the village and come to Colgate. That would be good for a bunch of reasons that we see there. It would be wonderful to replace number six fuel oil. And number two, we could convert some of the campus vehicle fleet to compress natural gas. By the way, natural gas has a lower carbon footprint than any other fossil fuel, better than coal better than petroleum, better than gasoline, better than diesel fuel. So for each, each use that we replace, say, number six fuel oil with natural gas, we lower our carbon footprint. We also save money, it turns out, which I like. I like to see us do both as a person that worries about the kind of the financial future of the institution. And when we can do both, that's great. So for all these reasons, uh, we would like to see this move forward. There are environmental concerns, and most of those are related not to natural gas itself, but a proposed development which is now going on in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, and also in other states, Texas, so-called Barnett Shale, which involve extracting natural gas from shale formations that 
in the old days we would never have thought of drilling into for natural gas because the gas comes out with great difficulty. And to get the gas out, you have to fracture the rock at depth using high pressure water that's called hydrofracturing or hydrofracking. And it's really caused a lot of concern in New York. And right now there's a, there, is, there are no wells being permitted that involve this technique. And I show this diagram because this is actually a well, a cartoon of a well drilled uh, just up the, uh, the hill from my house. I live out on River Road and if you, know, if you remember Hamilton, uh, if you go southwest out Lebanon Street, you go past some farmland and then there's a little hamlet called Randallsville. And when I was a student, there was a place there called Vinnie's of Randallsville, Vinnie's Hotel. And it was, as I like to say, a den of iniquity. <laughs> my mother would have actually said that. Don't, I, I always tell my students, don't go to the jug, it's a den of iniquity. So my mother used that term. She was a quite religious Presbyterian lady. And there was a, 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 a when I would be home from college in the summer, there was a nearby bar kind of five miles away called The Hut. And I would always go to The Hut and, and she'd say, where are you going, Bruce? Oh, I'm gonna go over to The Hut and have a couple drinks. That's a den of iniquity, you stay away from that place. But out by Randallsville, just west of the campus, there are natural gas wells. And we've actually had a bit of a boom lit of natural gas development, not in the Marcellus Shale, what's shown here is actually, but it illustrates this technology of horizontal drilling where the drill goes down and then extends laterally out into the formation. And in the case of these wells that are currently being developed in the Hamilton area, there are natural fracture systems which allow the gas naturally to escape out of the formation. In the case of the Utica, which is down here, or the Marcellus, which is too shallow to develop around us, that's a part of the Hamilton group. That development requires this large-scale hydraulic fracturing, and it's, it's quite controversial. And currently, the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, is developing guidelines for these hydrofracture wells that will hopefully limit environmental impacts. The big worries are spilling of water at the surface. But this intersects with Colgate's own interests in energy development because we have a bunch of land. These are, these are uh, Colgate-owned properties and you're all familiar with, you know, this is the main campus area. Here's the village of Hamilton. I haven't labeled all this. These are the, what we call the Campus South. Uh, this is the Beatty Reserve, which uh, where there's a lot of activity that's, activities that go on with outdoor education. This is the Parker Farm, uh, which Trillium Mountain, which I noted before, is right about here. And then Buca Center and the gas companies that are developing these fields, the Bradley Brook, Brook and Lebanon fields, would love to get there, uh, would love to be able to develop those. Uh, the company that's involved in this is Norse Energy, and their, one, their chief geologist in the Northern Appalachian Basin is a guy by the name of Stuart Lowenstein. His son, Matt Lowenstein, was a member of your class. Matt graduated with you last spring, and Matt did some research with me. So I know their interest is to drill wells on Colgate's lands, and uh, we have not permitted any uh, drilling activity yet. We're actually trying to use that land to leverage pipeline installation. So there is a, a local boom. Here, here's the example of, of what this looks like when you're out there. On the, and again, this is right behind my house. This, so you walk up the hill, uh, you know, less than half a mile up the slope. I live down in Randallsville on River Road. Up on top, this was a drill rig that was set up actually in uh, October and November of this past fall. This is a slightly older well. This is what it looks like after the fact. So there's a lot of drilling activity, but then what's left is actually just the, the valves and Christmas tree system. Gas goes into a pipeline, and this is a saltwater storage tank from the brine that gets produced out of the well. If, as I turned around from that point, I could see the Colgate campus. So you can see, and it, the, the, again, the beauty of that area even though it's uh, late fall, um, it's quite a spectacular view. There has been a lot of pressure in the region, mainly 
well, it's an interesting co uh, way that this works. Larger landowners, particularly farmers, who hold extensive lands, want to be able to sell their gas in many cases because they have no other real sources of income because of the decline in the dairy economy. In our area, we've seen, I, I know of personally of farm families who've been able to hold on to their land because they've been able to sell natural gas, have wells drilled on their property. The property owner gets a royalty on the natural gas. Uh, the Marcellus Shale development would be much larger in scale. There's a lot more uh, potential there. The drilling operations, however, are also larger in scale. Uh, it's kind of like building a Walmart supercenter. I like to use the analogy. It's a big construction site that's active for a, a, a six months to maybe as mo much as a year. They drill a number of wells off these platforms. They fracture them. They install the gas, uh, the, the gas capture systems. And then the construction site goes away, and you're left with a fairly modest uh, surface disturbance. But on the other hand, there are other groups uh, who are worried about water quality issues. When you make these big construction sites, you've got a lot of chemicals that you're handling. There's a potential for disturbance. So right now, the state of New York has put uh, uh, basically, it's not really a moratorium. They are not permitting any of these large scale hydrofracturing wells. And it's become a bit of a political issue. I have gotten involved in this. Well, it's my own fault, I suppose. I, I, I didn't need to, but I've gotten asked enough by local community people to get involved. And I've been on some radio talk shows, and I've given talks. I gave a talk in, uh, outside of Syracuse a few months ago, a few weeks ago, actually, and was accused by a member of the audience of being a, quote, shill for the gas companies. I gave the same talk two, week, two weeks later down in Shenango counties, and I was accused, same talk, same topic, same pitch at the issue, and I was accused of being a rabid environmentalist. <laughs> so there you go. It gives you some sense of the fine line that this, this issue tilts on. So regionally, down to our south in Shenango County and Broome County, if you remember driving, if you drive from here to Hamilton, you go through Binghamton, a lot of the development will be down in Broome County, uh, southern Shenango County, we will not see any Marcellus Shield development in Madison County, Otsego County, Delaware County, Sullivan County over here. These are part of the New York City watershed. Uh, and that is, of course, of concern to folks who live in New York. Will this, in the city, will somehow impact the water quality of that big water system? Politically, that has meant that downstate legislators have pushed very hard to prevent this drilling from going forward. The New York City the local New York City Department of Environmental Protection has issued a statement saying they don't want it to happen. They don't want this drilling to move forward. So the folks, the DEC folks in Albany are receiving a lot of political pressure right now. The gas companies, of course, want to drill. The landowners want to drill. The environmental groups and some other groups are against it. Uh, some landowner groups don't want it to happen because of viewscape issues, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really quite it's a fascinating at one level, actually, at another level, it's disturbing to see how quickly people stay, take sides and how neighbor gets pitted against neighbor very quickly in this sort of situation. So we can't forget that Colgate sits, I'm actually, this is a, another aerial view looking off to the northwest. Even though we're surrounded by this sort of bucolic uh, natural setting, energy and energy resources and sustainability are something we really uh, have to look to in the future. And, as much as we can, we want, to, uh, we want to work with our local community, the village of Hamilton in particular, because we, we, and we, uh, we and the village, Colgate and the village, are one thing. And the more that we can do to help the region in terms of uh, energy and economic issues, the better. So I'll stop yakking right there and take any questions that people have. Questions, yes. It's, it's called geothermal, shallow geothermal, and shallow, it's, it's sometimes geothermal heat pump. So you're, you basically, um, say in my backyard out on River Road, I dig a trench probably 80 feet by 40 feet, down 8 feet, and I would put in that a closed loop of refer, uh, 
probably just a like uh, antifreeze solution from your car, ethylene glycol and water. That would be a closed loop. That um, refrigerant would circulate into my basement at 51 degrees. I would use that refrigerant actually to heat some air to 51 degrees and then I would compress the air, this is one way of doing it, until it heated up to maybe 80 degrees and I'd use that to heat my house. And then that would extract the heat from the water which would go back into the loop, circulate back through and get heated up again. It's better if you've got a lake. Cornell University is actually doing this using Cayuga Lake. And the wonderful thing about these uh, shallow geothermal closed systems is that you can use it as a coolant in the summer. So you can run your air conditioning off the same heat sink. And so in that case, you're taking indoor air that's maybe 85 degrees, you're running it over a yeah. loop, you're heating up that refrigerant a little bit and you're running it back into the ground, but it gets cooled off by the time it comes back into your basement. Energy-wise, they can, say if I were heating my house with straight electric baseboard heating, you know, just burning electricity, a geothermal heat pump system would save me probably about 40 or 50 percent of my cost, direct cost, but I've got system installation costs that would take 10 or 15 years to amortize probably. But, sorry. Well, <laughs> well, we're trying to look forward on a number of these issues and it's really, it's really interesting actually, it's interesting stuff. Matt. Yeah, a complicated question. I, I don't know. First off, I don't know. Um, I, I also think that, I think geothermal heat pump is something that we will apply on a small scale in certain settings. The other issue is that the village has regulated geothermal heat pump because of concerns about water quality. Once you put this refrigerant in the ground, you want to be careful that it doesn't spill. So they actually have some fairly stringent regulations. Interesting, I helped them draft it, so it's my own fault. But they're, they're really trying to constrain the amount of this development in the village because uh, the, the aquifer is the valley, there's the village, and our source of drinking water is right over at the edge of the, well, here's Payne Creek coming out of Taylor Lake. These are the uh, high school fields. Our water wells for the village are right here. So there's a, there's a great sensitivity to water quality in the village rightfully so. And the geothermal systems are ideally built so they never contaminate the, the aquifer, but they have concerns about that. Kristen. Um, so Colby doesn't use any wind energy right now? Well, we use the wind energy that's coming in to us from the grid. Okay. So you look at the windmills off, off, we see them from campus all the time. They're putting power into the grid. And we're using that in the village as electricity. So the photons that are keeping the lights on in the hose center, some percentage of those that varies with wind conditions are coming from, from wind. The majority of our electricity, though, comes from hydro, the big power dams on the St. Lawrence River and the Niagara Falls and in the Adirondacks, and uh, from nuclear power plants along uh, southern Lake Ontario, Oswego area. Yes? Six miles north of the village, uh, parallel to Route 20, and we actually have a project with the village right now to do further cost analysis about getting that gas pipeline to the village. This has to be, the village as a municipal utility can legally do all this, can bond, can put, put in the uh, distribution system, and we're helping them with technical expertise basically at the moment and also assuring that we will actually buy the gas if they deliver it. But it's about six miles. A ballpark cost is, you know, right now is actually a good time to put in gas pipeline because there's a lot of people out there trying to get contracts, probably $200,000 a mile ballpark. Is propane widely used and why isn't propane used at all? Well, when, 
when we take natural gas out of the ground, about 94% of it, at least in Hamilton area, is methane. Propane is a component of that. So to get propane like we use in our barbecues, um, you actually set, you compress the gas and you separate the propane as a liquid. And the methane stays in the distribution system as natural gas. The reason we do that, frankly, is propane's a little safer to handle. Um, I like to use the analogy, if you, if you turn on your propane barbecue and you forget to light it right away, and then you go and light it, it'll go poof, and it'll probably burn your eyebrows off. If it were methane, natural gas, and you did that for the same amount of time, it would probably explode and drive uh, the, um, the grill into your face because of the force of natural gas versus propane explosion. So there's a reason we use propane. It's a lot safer to handle. Propane is actually used uh, in the natural gas drilling industry in some places as a fluid to do fracturing. It doesn't work so well in shales, it turns out, for all kinds of complicated reasons. But, but propane is, of course, uh, it's an extraction. It's more expensive than, than natural gas. I mean, natural gas is currently, for domestic heating, it's, it's cheaper than anything else. Right now, cheaper than fuel oil, cheaper than coal, even delivered coal. Isn't propane cheaper than gasoline? Yes. Uh, right now, I'm trying to think because I just had propane delivered a couple of weeks ago, and I think it was a few cents a, on a delivered basis, to a few cents per gallon cheaper. You get less energy out of propane than you do out of gasoline. It turns out per pound per weight. But it's it's a better fuel from a carbon footprint perspective, and you know, the, the, propane is usually not piped; it's delivered in compressed form in tanks, and so it's it has a delivery cost. That's what natural gas, like electricity, goes through a pipe, and you don't need a truck to to carry it around. I think the question is why aren't they told to convert it over to a I, to the city? It's probably yeah. economic, and that's why you don't see propane. Well, we don't have supply. That's the big issue. Yeah. And what I, I would love to see is a development. We have um, a, a site called the, Mad or the Hamilton Village Air Park, just north on 12B, which has, we've got permits for all kinds of light industry to go in there. Light industry comes and looks and says, this is a lovely town, it'd be a great area, but do you have natural gas? Because natural gas for you know building, for uh, any industrial application is so much cheaper than electricity or or fuel oil. And uh, one of the th developments I would love to see is then a compressed natural gas conversion business because you can convert your vehicle to CNG, costs about $1,200, and then have a CNG refueling station located, or a number of them, convert the, the campus fleet to compressed natural gas. We gain a lot that's actually cheaper because compressed natural gas is cheaper than propane, is cheaper than gasoline, and we reduce our carbon footprint at the same time. I like those two things, saving money and being green. When they come together, it's great. I actually yeah. live on a natural gas pipeline in uh, Connecticut, and I know they have the clear cut um, about 20 feet on either yeah. side. Is there any sort of public opposition to it? Uh, there yeah, the interest, the, the, the good piece of this is that the village owns the right of way sort of two thirds of the way north and it's along the old uh, railroad grade. I don't know if you remember that if you go north of Hamilton, the old railroad. And so we actually have right of way that is already kind of a non natural. Uh, there would be the last mile to get to the pipeline would involve some property issues. But it's along an existing corridor of development. It's not. It's not going through pristine woods. But yeah, those right of way issues are are ones that we face, and you have to ultimately get from uh, the Public Service Commission of New York State. You have to get permits and all that. Is there another question? Yes. Yeah. A couple of reasons. One is uh, the turbulence, the eddies that they shed will interfere with the next windmill in the row. So if you, if you, if you, if you put them too close together, that's a problem. Uh, the second thing is that they throw ice at one another as the blades are spinning off. 
in our climate in particular in the winter, um, I've gone up to the Tug Hill site there and watched big sheets of ice come off the blades. That's why they don't want people too close to them actually because they will actually capture condensate from the air as ice and then shear it off. Um, so there are a couple of issues there. there you don't want to put them so close to a neighbor's house that when they fall over because one actually did recently up in our local wind farm. So yeah, these things will, there will always be something that will go wrong. And would solar energy be not at all? Well solar, uh, actually we have a project right now because uh, with Rich Kessel's help to try to site a, I'm trying to remember whether it's four, 4,000 kilowatts, that sounds too big. It must be 400 kilowatt array somewhere in the area. This is with state funding. You know, solar and wind are great, but they are about 30. We have this thing called the capacity factor. It's only about, well, in our area for wind, it's about 35%. It's about 28% for solar. So that means you always have to have some other electric source. But whenever you're using that, solar or wind, you're, you're replacing or potentially replacing a fossil fuel, a coal-fired, uh, for example, energy uh, electric source. But the percent of time that you can actually count on power from that source, wind is about 35% ideally, or 35% in our area. Solar's lower for all the reasons that we have all experienced. Uh, a, a nuclear power plant generally runs at about 95%, uh, coal fired plant 96%, natural gas fired about 99%. They're basically 1% of the time they'll be down and running 90. So you need to have in, hydro is essentially 100%, it's great. Uh, you need to have in your grid system things with high capacity factor to balance or to be available during the times when your wind and solar or other uh, Low capacity factor is, is, is not operating. Yeah. Um, with that, I, I know I'm, I'm assuming that the consumption of energy on these plants is a lot less during the summer. Have you ever, never, ever done any thought to like fuel cells, like storing energy during the summer for use during the winter or anything like that? Yeah, it's, it, it, that would be mean hydrogen taking solar power, using it to split hydrogen and oxygen and water, and then storing the hydrogen, and then burning it back in a fuel cell. Yeah, the economics of that are daunting on any scale, even approaching the campus scale, because um, fuel cells are great if you're putting a space shuttle into space, but they're very expensive to, to build and to maintain. So we use them in space because it's, you need high concentration, you need a highly concentrated fuel like hydrogen. Probably not, honestly. What I'd lo also love to see is a, electric vehicle fleet, maybe the universities that we would use as a sink when the wind power or the solar is spinning. And so we got all that battery capacity that stored energy and then the guys in P&G could drive around or we could go on field trips in electric vans, wouldn't that be cool? It'd be hard to go to Utah though. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and Look forward to chatting some more, but I know it's Sunday night and people f want to find out who's in the NCAA, right? It was Selection Sunday. Oh, well, thank you, Christine. I appreciate being a host.